It's day 124 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. Welcome to Bible study. If you are new here, please let us know where you are watching from. Everybody else, if you could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up, making sure you're subscribed to the channel and make sure you hit the notification bell as well so you know when every video drops each day because we all know that it's at different times. Also, make sure you're connected with us in our Facebook group. You can find all the info in the description box below. Today, we are in 1 Chronicles chapters 13 through 16. Setting this up, the Israelites have low morale, and because so, David almost desperately goes out seeking for the Ark of the Covenant to be returned and to be placed in the center of worship. But out of this desperation, he makes some really poor decisions, and we are going to see that it is fatal. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, as we read your word today, we know how important it is to do things in your will, to do things the way that you tell us. So I pray that you will make that so clear for each and every one of us today. Give us this day our daily bread, exactly what we need to hear from you, Lord, on this day. Whoever is watching this video, doesn't matter if it is on day 124 or if it is on day 65 for them. Lord, you are here to meet them where they're at. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So currently the Ark of the Covenant is in Kiriath Jerim. And remember the Ark is a symbol of God's holy presence. It is where his glory dwells. It's that golden box that's generally kept in the Holy of Holies. The Ten Commandments is stored in it. So we know uh, from reading this back in the beginning days, the early days, I can't remember which chapter, but if you have not gone back to the original chapter, the beginning, Highly recommend doing that so that you don't skip a beat as to what we are speaking of. So here in verse 1, David consulted with the commanders of thousands and of hundreds with every leader. Mistake number one, not that he's seeking wise counsel. This is a very good thing, but it's out of order because he should have gone to the Lord first. David is generally very good about inquiring of the Lord, but here he just gets ahead of himself and he decides to go to people instead. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and from the Lord, our God. So there we are out of order again. He's saying, if you guys think it's right. Oh, and from God too. Let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in all the lands of Israel, as well as to the priests and the Levites in the cities that have pasture lands that they may be gathered to us. Then let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. So David being the man after God's heart, um, this is probably why he's so excited to bring the ark back. Previously, Saul had neglected God, right? And David didn't want to follow in those footsteps. So he is like, we got to do things the right way. But sadly, he is doing a good thing, but the wrong way. All the assembly agreed to do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now, before we move forward, let's review how the Ark was to be treated. One, it was to be only carried by the Levites, but no one was to touch it because if you touched the Ark of the Covenant, you would be put to death because this violated the holiness of God. And secondly, it was to be carried by poles on the shoulders of the people. So keep that in mind as we continue reading. And just looking at some of the good things that are happening here, once again, David has a lot of zeal for the holiness of God. He's excited about it. All of the people are as well. There's a lot of unity going on here, which is amazing. So we don't want to discount the good things that are happening here. They are wanting to bring the ark to their place of worship. They are wanting to bring it from obscurity to a place of prominence. Again, an awesome thing. All right. Moving on, verse 5. So David assembled all of Israel from the Nile of Egypt, which is down south, to Lebo Hamath, which is up north, so all of the people, to bring the Ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. And they're wanting to bring it to the newly seized capital of Jerusalem. And David and all of Israel went up to Baalah, that is, to Kiriath Jerim, that belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord, who sits enthroned above the cherubim. And they carried the Ark of God on a new cart. All right, here we go. Remember, it's not supposed to be carried on a cart. It's supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the people. 
but they're probably thinking, look at this cart we've got. This is amazing. It's going to help us to be efficient. It's shiny. It's got big wheels. Oh, so they take it from the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ahio were driving the cart. So Uzzah, actually, his name means strength or strong. And Ahio, I believe, means, I think, friendly. And David and all of Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, with song, with lyres, harps, and tambourines, and cymbals, and trumpets. So notice that they are worshiping, they are joyful, they are glad, they are doing all these things. So they've got all the feelings going on. But this is the reason why worship and worshiping God cannot be based on feeling alone. We cannot rely on our feelings to let us know that the presence of God is with us. And here in this case, we see that David and all of the people are so excited. They think they're doing the right thing and therefore their feelings are almost deceiving them. Verse 9, and when they came to the threshing floor of Kaidan, Uzzah put out his hand to take hold of the ark for the oxen stumbled. So sadly, this is a really crappy situation. Uzzah is wanting to do the right thing by not allowing the ark to fall to the ground. So he reaches out to catch it. But this again is dishonoring the holiness of God because he very specifically said to never touch it no matter what. And now we're going to see what happens. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark and he died there before God. It seems unfair, but again, God was so clear about this. So David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. Well, I would imagine, or I would ask, well, who's he angry at? Is he angry at God? Is he angry at himself? Because maybe he's embarrassed that, you know, maybe this was his first big event as king and it's failing. I don't know. I don't know who he's angry at, but he was angry nevertheless. And that place is called Pires Uzzah to this day, which means the breaking out against Uzzah. And David was afraid of God that day. And he said, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David... He did not, hang on, did not take the ark home into the city of David. So he basically abandoned the mission altogether, but instead he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the household of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that he had. And I was thinking, man, if I was this man, Obed, Edom, would I take the ark into my house after seeing Uzzah just struck down dead after seeing and knowing, you know, the requirements to take care of it, but he was obedient. And because so his household was blessed. And we know that Obed, Edom is a Kohathite. So he is a Levite. So this was okay that he was taking care of the ark. So God, you know, he's not just concerned with the outcome or the destination of where we are going. He is more concerned about the process along the way. Here we see some really big lessons to learn, be learned here. I mean, David made a decision under pressure and he made it in the moment. And those decisions matter to God. So we are not going to be able to come before the Lord and say, well, shoot, I didn't realize it. Or, oh man, I was under pressure. No, those decisions matter for Uzzah in this case. You know, when he made the decision to catch the ark, he was struck down dead. It still matters. Good intentions are not enough in the eyes of God. And then as far as David goes, he was basically careless in the way that he cared for the ark. And I sit here and wonder, like, I wonder how much we become careless of God's holiness. The words that we speak, the conversations that we have with people, do we treat our everyday life as something that is holy? Because guess what? If we are truly anointed by the Lord and he dwells in our hearts, his glory, his presence dwells within us, we need to be treating our own lives with that same care. We cannot be careless about it. And God already gives us so much grace. Have you ever heard your kids say, well, he did it like that or she did it? This is exactly what's happening here with the Ark of the Covenant because the Philistines had captured the Ark prior and they transported it on a cart and yet they weren't treated the way that the Israelites were treated by God. They weren't held to that same standard, but that's just the thing. When you are under the anointing of God, if you are going to consider yourself 
his people, then you are going to be held to a higher standard. And we are never going to be able to look around at the world and say, well, they're doing it that way and think that we're going to get some sort of hall pass. And the Philistines treated the ark as if it were some good luck charm. And to a certain extent, David may have been treating it that way as well by thinking that if he brings the ark of the covenant back into the center of worship, into the capital, then maybe they'll be favored or they'll be blessed. And even though that blessing blessing will follow the Ark of the Covenant, it's not because of the box itself, it's because of the presence of God that comes with it. So we can't box God in to some sort of inanimate object. We can't rely on the power of the presence from something or from someone else. For instance, we can't rely on the presence of God and the favor and the blessing of God to come upon us because we went to church or because we're in a certain Bible study or because we're listening to a certain type of of worship. The presence of God and the holiness of God has to be revered on such a personal level in such an intimate way. So church, Bible study, worship music, all those things wonderful. But at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is your personal communion with the Lord, you personally coming into his presence, you personally being humble before him and having that awe and that reverence for his presence. But despite David's failure, of course, God still favors him. So here in chapter 14, this is this happening be uh, at the end of his reign. So this chronicler, the person who wrote this, actually wrote it out of order or didn't stick to the timeline, but that's okay. Uh, and Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees, also masons and carpenters to build a house for him. So here we see that David not only was a great warrior, uh, he was a great king of Israel, but apparently he had the ability to make really great political alliances, which he did here with Hiram, who is giving him favor, blessing him with all of this wood. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. This is a really key thing here. The fact that David knew. He knew, one, that the Lord had established him and he knew that his kingdom was exalted for the sake of the people. So it was about God and it was about people and he knew it. So Hiram is not a believer. I mean, he's not a follower of God. He's not an Israelite, but God still uses him. Because if we cut ourselves off, how are we ever going to be witnesses, you know, to to people who are not Christians? So we still got to be loving to every single person out there and not cut ourselves off from non-believers just because they're not Christian. Because how else are they going to get saved, right? Like people need, <laughs> we need, we need them. They need us. They're going to help build our faith too. So this is what uh, King David was really good at. And look what happened. Like God actually used him to bless David. And David took more wives in Jerusalem. Okay, not good. <laughs> Polygamy, again, not a good thing. And we see problems that are will extend out into David's life for generations. And David fathered more sons and daughters. These are the names of the children born to him in Jerusalem. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon. Those all from Bathsheba. And then there's Ibhar, Elishua, Eliphalet, Noga, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishima, Bealida, and Eliphalet. Did we see Eliphalet twice? Oh, this is Elpilet. I said it wrong. This one's Elpilet. This one's Eliphalet. And now we are going to see that even though David is anointed, he is blessed. Well, we know that when there's an anointing on people, the greater your anointing, the bigger the attack. So this happening before he took Jerusalem. So remember when I said things were out of order? So this is one of the cases here. And this is a repeat of what we read in 2 Samuel, I believe, 5. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all of Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went out against them. Now the Philistines had come and made a raid in the valley of Rephium. And David inquired of God, good thing. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to him, go up and I will give them into your hand. And he went up to Baal Perizim and David struck them down there. And David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand, like a bursting flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perizim. And they left their gods there and David gave command and they were burned. So watch what happens though. 
the enemy defeated in this case, but he's not going to give up. He regroups, he returns. And that is the way that the enemy is even spiritually with us. So anytime you defeat the enemy, you can't just sit back and relax because you know that he's going to come back. Now, David, thankfully, didn't depend on military might or even his past victories. He made sure that he inquired of God. He knew that he needed that heavenly intervention in this earthly situation. So again, we need to be prayed up at all times. And the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley. And when David again inquired of God, second time, good thing, David, God said to him, you shall not go up after them, go around and come against them opposite of the balsam trees. So remember, we read this the other day. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, so when you see the wind blowing the trees, then go out to battle. Now, King James Version says, bestir thyself, which to me is for us in this spiritual battle, it means Stir yourself up. Start praying. When you see the moving or the movement of the Lord, start praying. For God has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as God commanded him. And they struck down the Philistine army from Gibeon to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all the lands. And the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. So why did God do it this way? Why did he change the course? One is to show that the battle was his and two was probably to test the faithfulness of David to make sure that he was going to seek him, that he was going to follow his commands and to show that if he did, that God would make good on his promise. Chapter 15. So David built houses for himself in the city of David and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the Ark of God. Well, there it is, David, if you had only known that before. How did he know this now? He probably spent time in the Word researching, like, I need to get this right this time. What do I need to do? So he made sure that he knew exactly how it was prescribed. And now he is telling the people, this is the way it is to be done. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the Ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. This is such an amazing example of how David's failure led him straight to the word of God. Because sometimes we will fail or we will be frustrated in the things that we are doing, thinking that we are doing the right thing, thinking that we are on the right path, and then we get stopped dead in our tracks or something happens tragically and we may not understand it. But take note that it may be God wanting to get your attention, to turn you back, to bring you back to his word, to get that instruction once again. Because the thing is, this is not just a mere book. These aren't just words. These are direct commands from God. And whenever we mix our own human strength and flesh and all of our thoughts with that divine authoritative voice of God, the results can be tragic. They can be fatal at times. So instead of a allowing that to happen in the first place, if we are diligently seeking him every single day, asking the questions, inquiring of the Lord, we should be able to receive that daily instruction so that we are able to stay on course and do the right things the right way. So don't wait for tragedy to get the instruction. So David assembled all of Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. And David gathered together the sons of Aaron and the Levites of the sons of Kohath, Ariel, the chief with 120 of his brothers of the sons of Merari, Asaiah, the chief with 220 of his brothers of the sons of Gershom, Joel, the chief with 130 of his brothers of the sons of Elizaphan, Shimea, the chief with 200 of his brothers, the sons of Hebron, Eliel, the chief with 80 of his brothers of the sons of Uziel, Aminadab the chief with 112 of his brothers. Then David summoned the priests Zadok and Abiathar and the Levites Uriel, Asaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab, and said to them, You are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves. So, hello, cleanse yourselves, sanctify yourselves, make sure that you are clean before the Lord. So consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the Lord of the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel to the place that I have prepared for it. So David is preparing the people for the ark because you did not carry it the first time. The Lord, our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. This is a major 
mega important sentence here. God broke out against us because we didn't seek him according to the rule, according to his plans. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the Ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the Ark of God on their shoulders, well done, with the poles, well done, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So now they're doing it right. Verse 18, David also commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers who should play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals to raise sounds of joy. So now we are seeing worship being done in an orderly fashion, and we're going to see that continue here. So the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel. This is also the grandson of Samuel. And of his brothers Asaph, the son of Berechiah, sons of Merari, their brothers, Ethan, the son of Kushea, and with them their brothers of the second order, Zechariah, Jeaziel, uh, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, Benaiah, Maaseah, Metathiah, and, oh boy, Elif, Eliphelehu, Eliphelehu, there we go, <laughs> and Mikmia, and the gatekeepers, Obed, Edom, and Jeel. The singers, Heman, Asaph, and Ethan, were to sound bronze cymbals, Zechariah, Aziel, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, and Maesila, and Benaiah were to play harps according to Elamoth. But the Mattathiah, Eliphelu, Mikneia, Obed Edom, Jeel, and Azaziah were to lead with liars according to the Sheminith. Okay, so what we see here are people being appointed to worship as worship leaders, as the band. So it's not just anybody, one and all, whoever wants to sing can sing, whoever wants to play music can play music. It's people are appointed. This is an orderly fashion of worship. Again, there's order in worship, okay? Um, Kenaniah, leader of the Levites in music, should direct the music for he understood it. So there should be excellence in worship. People need to understand music. The director needs to be able to direct the people so there is authority in it. Berechiah and Elkanah were to be the gatekeepers for the ark. Shebaniah, jo Josaphat, Nathanael, Amasai, Zechariah, Benaiah, and Eliezer for priests, or the priests should blow the trumpets before the ark of God. And Obed-Edom and Jehiah were to be gatekeepers for the ark. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. And because God helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. So 2 Samuel chapter 6, which we have not read yet, actually says that they offered sacrifices every six steps. And remember, number six is the number of the flesh. Some scholars say that they believe that Uzzah may have uh, been struck down on the sixth step. But the fact of the matter is, is that God is not interested in efficiency because clearly every six steps offering a sacrifice is not the most efficient thing to do, but he is more concerned about effectiveness, doing the right thing the right way, right? When we do things the God's way, joy will follow and notice how much rejoicing and joy comes into this chapter. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as also were all the Levites who were carrying the ark and all the singers of Kenaniah and the leader of the music of the singers. So they were all dressed the same, no one trying to bring attention to themselves. There was uniformity. And of course, we know that for the high priests, their uniforms symbolized God's presence. And David wore a linen ephod. So all of Israel... So not just a one-man show here. This is all of Israel bringing up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting to the sound of the horn, trumpets, and cymbals, and made loud music on harps and lyres. And as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul. So remember, this is the daughter that was originally Saul's wife. I mean, sorry, David's wife. So the daughter of Saul. And 
she ended up um, marrying somebody else. Remember, she was given to somebody else. David was running from Saul, so she ended up being with somebody else. And in the end, Saul demanded that she be brought back to him as his wife. So she was taken away from her husband, who we can only assume that she actually really loved because the husband, remember, he was like crying and weeping the whole way. So now we can have that context so we can see what happens here. Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. So why does she despise him? Well, let's just take a look here at what I wrote the last time I studied this. I don't think this was last year because this looks like the pen that I bought la um, recently. I think I may have studied this. May maybe it was last year, but not you know according to the reading plan. But I wrote here, total diva. <laughs> and I had to cross that out because I thought to myself, and this is just going to show how much I've changed from last year or the last time I read this to now, that I was being so judgmental of her. I have a lot more compassion for Michael at this point because even though, and I, I believe every time I ever read this, I looked at her as a diva or as somebody who was evil. And how do I know that? I mean, maybe somebody knows something I don't, but I've got to look at this at face value and the fact that she was probably upset, one, because she was basically given to David by her father and she was probably very loyal to her father. And then not only that, but she, you know, she was taken away from the husband that she actually loved by David. So she's upset about it. Does she have the right to be upset? I don't know, but she is. And so I have grace and I have a little bit of compassion for her. Um, but when we look at the overall picture, clearly Michael and David are very unequally yoked. And Saul even laughed when he gave Michael to David, thinking that she would trap him, you know, that she would cause problems for him. And so we are seeing that happening right here. We will see in the end that God ends up rebuking her. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, she is going to be rebuked for mocking David and his worship and therefore she will be struck barren. So we've got to be really careful because worship is one of those things that can often be mocked. And when I look at what David was doing, um, he was dancing before the Lord, playing loud music, but I believe that they were doing this in an orderly fashion. So they weren't drawing attention to themselves as individuals. They weren't trying to perform. They weren't trying to, you know, do anything outside of purely worshiping the Lord with true joy and rejoicing. And so therefore mocking that would have been against God. Chapter 16. So the ark is now going to be placed in the tent. So they're coming in with worship. And anytime you lead anything with worship, you are inviting the presence of God in. So they are doing things the right way. It's just the same way with church. Like we start with worship because we're inviting the presence of God, the glory of God to enter in. He's not going to come in by power or might, right? He's going to come in by his spirit carried on the shoulders of worshipers. So they brought in the ark of God and set it inside the tent, which is the proper place for it to be, that David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all of Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. So this is like a big old Sunday barbecue. They are fellowshipping together. This is like a fellowship offering. This is a time of thanksgiving, a time of worship, a time of praise. It's a joyful occasion. Then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. So this is more of, an, a, of a permanent appointment. This is not just a, hey, I need you, 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 and do these jobs. You, 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 you know, I need you guys to come and carry this. No, this is going to be permanent um, appointings for the people, the Levites to be of service in the temple or in the uh, tent. So Asaph was the chief and second to him, Zechariah, Jael, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Mattathiah, Eliah, Benaiah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, who were to play harps and lyres. Okay, so there's the musicians. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, Benaiah, and Jehaziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly. 
So this is a regular type of thing. This is, again, not just a temporary setup before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first appointed that Thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. So all of these appointments were for one to invoke or to record down the blessings of God, to thank him, to praise him. And here we're going to see how he appointed that Thanksgiving to be sung, how to praise God. This is basically like a wor how to worship handbook right here. And this comes out of Psalm 105. Oh, so exclamation, give thanks to the Lord. So this is number one, give thanks. This is how you can praise God. Call upon his name. Number two, this is how you praise God. You call upon him. So this is a call to corporate praise to everybody. Number three, make known his deeds among the peoples. Tell people about him. What are your conversations like? Four, sing to him. Sing praises to him. Even if you can't carry a tune, it is a sweet sound to the Lord if your heart is right before him. Number five, tell of all his wondrous works. Another one. So let's do a heart check here. How much have you given thanks, called upon the Lord, made known his deeds, sang praises to him, and told people of his wondrous works? What is your lifestyle showing? What are your conversations like? The conversation one being a big one, because guess what? If you talk more about God, guess who you'll talk less about? Yourself and other people. You won't want to talk about other people's business if you're talking about God's business. Number six, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who, number seven, seek the Lord rejoice. So we're going to glory in him. We're going to seek him with all of our heart. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. So this isn't just a once, you know, once in the morning and that's it. We forget about him. No, this is a continual thing throughout your day. Number eight, remember the wondrous works that he has done. So reflect on his faithfulness often. O oh, offspring of Israel, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. So this is a declaration that God's authority is not limited to just Israel. It is over all of all people. Remember his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Now remember that covenant is a legal, but also a formal binding of the people to God. It was like this mutual loyalty, this mutual commitment that they had, and it was based on the faithful character of God. The covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute to Israel, as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. So this whole section here, all based on the covenant, which makes sense as the Ark of the Covenant makes its way in to the tent. When you were few in number, because remember, when this all first started with Jacob, there were only 70 people. And now there's millions of little account and sojourners in it wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them, including Pharaoh in Genesis 12. He rebuked kings on their account, including, including Abimelech in Genesis 20, saying, touch not my anointed ones, those who are set apart for me. Do my prophets no harm. And some scholars say this prophet is speaking specifically about Abraham, but it could just mean anybody who had that gift of prophecy. And now we move into a section here that is found in Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord all the earth. So again, Israel had that special duty to sing to the Lord, but it was a call for all other nations to also sing to him in praise. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. So just as Israel was called to do this, to be that example for others, for the other nations, we are to be the same way. We've got to look at people like the other nations, anybody who is unsaved like another nation outside of Israel, because we are the church. We are to be people who are showing others who God is and telling of his salvation and declaring his glory and his marvelous works. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. Now, I know that this has been in debate, this all God situation, um, even whenever it says uh, there should be no other gods before me. That isn't necessarily a um, 
admission and admission of other gods. It's simply saying that if you believe in other gods, then I am to be feared above those other gods that you believe in. But we know that God is the only true living God. All others, they are inanimate. They are, um, they, they are not alive. You know, so, so this is what we got to remember whenever we read things about other gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. There it is right there. That just, that explains it. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. So you won't get all this from the other gods that you might believe in. Splendor, majesty, strength, and joy. Ascribe to the Lord or otherwise attribute to him, O families of the peoples, Attribute to him or ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. So some people would read ascribe to him or give to him glory and strength, not because he doesn't have it. So that's why we change the meaning or translate it here to attribute glory and strength to God. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him in all the earth. So again, that prescription of how to worship him. Yes, the world is established. It shouldn't be or shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. So this is speaking of his sovereignty. You know, God wants all nations to turn to him. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. So this is what is called personification, where you give inanimate objects, characteristics of humans. But this overall message is that, you know what? Creation is going to praise God. Creation does praise God. So we, being far greater and having dominion over creation, should more so be people who praise and exalt the Lord. And then this, for he comes to judge the earth, could be a um, speaking of the second coming of Jesus. Verse 34, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. We've been reading that a lot. Say also, save us, O God of our salvation and gather and deliver us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Then all God's people said and everybody write in the comments a big old amen. If you say so be it, I believe it. I, I too stand among this prayer because when you speak it out, when you come into corporate agreement with other people and say, amen, then you are saying, let it be so, so be it that establishes this prayer. So if you believe in that, type in the comments, amen. We're going to be corporate about this. Verse 37, so David left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister regularly before the Ark as each day required. And also Obed-Edom and his 68 brothers, while Obed-Edom, the son of Jedithan and Hosa, were to be gatekeepers. And he left Zadok, the priest, and his brothers, the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord, in the high place that was at Gibeon. So there were two places of corporate worship, worship centers, one being the Mosaic worship center that was established here at Gibeon. And then also there will be that second one, which will be at Mount Zion. So they... Uh, came in worship before the Lord to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offerings regularly, morning and evening, to do all that is written in the law of the Lord that he commanded Israel. So they're getting back to basics. With them were Heman, Jeduthun, and the rest of those chosen and expressly named to give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Heman and Jeduthun had trumpets and cymbals for the music and instruments for sacred song. The sons of Jeduthun, and by the way, Jeduthun could have actually been the musician Ethan, were appointed to the gate. Verse 43, then all the people departed each to his house and David went home to bless his household. So now the ark is safe. Now they've done things the right way. 
And because they did things the right way, there's that true joy that is welling up within them. And they are able to leave the fellowship, go home and bless their household. Now, whether that was proclaiming a blessing upon their household or simply being a blessing in their household, we should look at it this way. When we leave church or when we leave our fellowship or when we leave our Bible study, whatever it is, we should walk away from that with that true joy welling up within us and we too should bless our household. We can pray over our household, but more than anything, we should be a blessing to our household because when we are that way, it's contagious. When we are a blessing to other people, we are bestowing that happiness and that joy that overflows from within and they will be blessed because of it. I can testify that this has been the game changer in my life, in my marriage, in my household. This simply has brought so much peace and joy in our home. The fact that when I leave Bible study and when I have done it the right way, when our family communes together at church, together in unity, when we come home, it isn't just back to normal, everybody fighting and bickering, we've all got anxiety, we're at a level 10 when it comes to the stresses of the world, no. It's so different now because again, remember when there is unity, God commands a blessing. So when you come together in unity with your family or with your community of believers, God will command that blessing and therefore you will be able to let that blessing overflow out of you into your own home, into your circumstances. So we thank you, Lord for your word today. Thank you so much for the life of David, for the lessons that we get to learn from him. Lord, we thank you for his leadership. We thank you for showing us that even when we mess up and we do things the wrong way, God, you still will pour out favor and blessing upon your people. Thank you that we can come in true confession and repentance for anything that we may have done in our past. God, I pray that you will help us recall them, Lord. Help us to remember the things that we've done. Let us get it right. But more than anything, help us to remember your wondrous works. I pray that we will be people who walk throughout our day continually being grateful for all that you are doing, that we will be in praise and worship, Lord, and that we will allow that joy to well up within to show others in our workspace, in our school, among our friends, among our family. May they see something different in us because of who you are within us, Lord. Help them to see you, Jesus, reflecting from within us. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you for your word. We are so grateful for it. We love you so much, God, and I just pray that you will bless your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die. But I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.